Does that sound a bit like home to you? If so, chances are you and most of your neighbors think and vote quite a bit more blue than red. This is The Purple Principle. I'm Robert Pease. And I'm Emily Corsetti. But if days and nights around your place are quite a bit more peaceful, then chances are your neighborhood leans way more red than blue, and more so all the time. We're talking geography on this edition of The Purple Principle, but not the geography of mountains and rivers. We're talking maps of people and neighborhoods, and unfortunately, of polarization. Meaning those beautiful deep blue and reds that we see on America's political maps are actually not so pretty when it comes to social dynamics. The fundamental importance of social geography, with not one but two political scientists named Ryan, specializing in the politics of place. Ryan Strickler of Colorado State University. He's the co-author of Demography, Politics, and Partisan Polarization in the U.S. from 1828 to 2016. There's so many ways in our lives in which we silo ourselves. And a lot of times people think of like siloing, like information siloing. I think it's underappreciated though, kind of the way we silo ourselves in our physical spaces. And Ryan Enos of Harvard University, author of the book, The Space Between Us. His recent work in the journal Nature was featured on the front page of the New York Times. As we started this conversation with, when people live separate from each other but close by, it really increases these feelings of animosity. And it seems like we have that going on between partisans, even in neighborhoods. We start with Ryan Enos on a personal level with the question, what led him to study our partisan politics through the lens of geography? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. That's actually something I like to talk about. Before I became an academic and I'm doing what I do now, I was actually a high school teacher. I moved out to Chicago to teach high school after graduating from college in California. And I was uh, living there and living on the north side of Chicago and teaching on the south side of Chicago. And if you know anything about Chicago, it's a extremely segregated city where people are just so divided by race and other things like income. And it was moving across that city every day that I realized how much segregation and where people live, how much that shapes their life and how they think and what they think about other people. And it was my few years of experience doing that that really made me decide that this was something really important to study. It's interesting to us, here's an urban place that has the segregation, but it seems pretty consistently democratic. Yeah, it definitely is. And it is now. One thing to say is, of course, urban places weren't always that way. You know, it used to be it wasn't so easy to predict where some place was Democratic or whether it was Republican based on whether it's urban or rural. But now density just predicts that like you wouldn't believe. And, you know, all the people that live in the city of Chicago itself are very democratic. As you move out, not that far, and this is what happens, as that density goes down in the Chicago metro area, people become much more likely to vote Republican. And that's true in almost any city in the United States. In the book, you spend some time on Alport's contact hypothesis. You say that Alport's hypothesis, not as simple as it sounds. It's not just contact. It's kind of the quality of the contact. So could you explain that for us? Yeah, well, it's about the quality of contact in a number of different dimensions. So Allport would talk a lot about things like equality between groups and shared goals and things like that. And that's why originally when he was talking about racial contact, a lot of the test places were things like the U.S. military, where people were brought together under a sort of a common identity and common goals. And it's not always obvious that that's going to exist when we talk about things like partisanship. The other thing that Allport talked about quite a bit, which people tend to overlook now, is he also said that when you put people in the same place, if they don't have real contact, if they're sort of segregated from each other, that that actually makes things worse. And so this is something else I focused on quite a bit in my research, that when we're segregated by race, even if we're close together, or if we're segregated by party and we're close together, that actually in many ways makes things worse. The worst possible outcome is when you're close but far, is one way to put this. Right. Well, Ryan, you've provided these very striking visual studies of polarization on your website, which we want to point our listeners to. But we're wondering how you account for the effects of gerrymandering. And right now, after the census, state legislatures are at it again, presumably creating more distinctly red and blue districts. 
Yeah, gerrymandering is is a very powerful force when it comes to shaping how legislators behave, right? You know, if you're only accountable to a certain type of person, then you're going to behave a certain way, right? It's going to take away the forces of moderation. And we can see this uh, in these congressional districts as they change over time. One thing that's interesting to think about, which you may have come across on previous shows, is that gerrymandering, though, can only explain so much of these problems of polarization we have, because even legislators in places, bodies, I mean, that can't be gerrymandered. So, for example, in the U.S. Senate, where no gerrymandering exists, these legislators are still pulling themselves apart. And so there's just a lot of other forces, as powerful as gerrymandering is, there's a lot of other forces that are going into this process. That is a great point from Ryan number one there, Ryan Enos. Gerrymandering can explain polarization in the Senate, as it does in the U.S. House, and for state legislatures. But maybe we need a quick refresher course on this thing called gerrymandering. A lot of listeners know the term. They know it has to do with the redrawing of districts. But the devil here is very much in the details, as we learned about in our season one episode with Trevor Potter, who was the former chair of the Federal Election Commission and now head of the Campaign Legal Center. Well, gerrymandering is a real problem because it means that whichever party is in power when the districts are drawn, which is every 10 years after our census, that party draws lines in a way that maximizes their number of seats. Now, in terms of polarization, it means that people are in districts that are safe for their party. So the only challenge they're going to get is in a party primary. And what tends to happen in both parties is that the energy comes from the base, who are the ones likely to vote in primaries. And generally, they tend to be on the more extreme side of their party. So gerrymandering is a big polarizing force in our legislatures, and that does feed back into our neighborhoods. Then in turn, our neighborhoods become even stronger forces for polarization, pulling people left in our cities and to the right in our rural towns. When we first started researching this topic, we thought that it would be primarily about movement patterns across states, and that formed our initial questions. But as any number of Ryans with PhDs will tell you, it actually has more to do with people staying in urban or rural places and conforming to the politics around them. Emily picks up the interview on that point. We are thinking that California is an interesting example politically, the way that it's become more blue in recent decades. So we're wondering, has that shift towards blue caused other shifts in red and purple moving to and from California? Yeah, sure. Well, and the opposite process is going on as well, where people, you know, from California that were Republicans have sorted out, right? And of course, we can overstate how much that goes on because most people stay where they are. You know, most people in the United States are born in a state, they die in that state. But nevertheless, there is some sorting that goes on. This especially happened, it was more of a long-term process than we somewhat appreciate. But in California, for example, a lot of people started moving out of the state in the 1980s and 90s, and perhaps people that were uncomfortable, we should say, with a certain level of diversity, that they accelerated moving out of that state. And so we see people moving out, and we see that accompanying with things like demographic change, where the state has become more heavily Latino over time. And at least in the short term, California is a place, since since Latinos is what I'm trying to say, vote more democratic, they're more likely it's going to shift the state blue. And so we've certainly seen that trend. It seems like the every action has an equal and opposite reaction for that. Well, there's something to be said for that. I mean, it's certainly we might imagine as a state like California, you know, as you mentioned, as it becomes more blue, it's possible that other people places become more red. And there's a lot that goes into that. But I'll tell you, it's fascinating. I grew up in California and I grew up in the Central Valley of California, which is sort of the farming part of California. And then I've lived in other places in the state. But it used to be that places in California were really kind of politically up for grabs. It had Republican governors for the longest time and it had Republican legislators. And now you just can't imagine California like that. It's such a reliably blue state. Could you think of any important or significant case study or examples of states recently that have had significant movements either into or out of them? 
Yeah, well, I'll say again, you know, it's not um, entirely clear how much of the political shifts are due to movement, but we can see these places that do become more reliably one party or another over time. If you think of like Texas, for example, which is hard, again, like California, it's hard to remember that Texas used to elect statewide Democrats. And it doesn't now. You know, people think it's changing, but at least in the last 30 years or so, it's been reliably on the statewide, very Republican. And it's possible to believe that a lot of that is, maybe not a lot, but a portion, let's say, of that has to do with people moving from California to Texas that brought those conservative values with them. So I'm very interested in the psychology part, and it seems like that plays a big factor. And so what is it about social isolation, do you think, that causes people to orient themselves towards conservative ideals? And uh, what is it about being around many people that seems to push people towards more progressive ideals? Yeah, well, I wish we knew. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are different between cities and more rural areas, right? And determining which one is causing this is really hard to do, right? And so I think that one of the next frontiers of understanding this urban-rural divide and the political consequences of it is understanding what exactly is causing that. There's some speculation that it could have to do with things that are correlated with political party. For example, it seems like liberals are more comfortable with uncertainty than conservatives are. They kind of don't mind that kind of variation in their life. And if you think about living in a real dense place, the world just sort of changes more quickly around you, if you will. And it could be those things line up to make liberals more comfortable in dense places. Yeah, there were news reports suggesting that people were more susceptible to the Stop the Steal campaign and Trump's misinformation because they personally didn't know anybody nearby who voted for Biden or didn't see any signs for Biden, et cetera. So do you think that geographic polarization is a threat to our elections and to our democracy as a whole? Oh, yeah, of course. It absolutely is. And the anecdote you gave is it's 100% backed up by what we know about political communication and what we know about psychology and a lot of other factors, right? There's that old quip about, you know, how did Nixon win? I don't know anybody that voted for him, which was said by some woman in Manhattan, if I remember correctly, right? And so that was 50 years ago now, right? And of course, in Manhattan in 1970, there was a lot of people that voted Republican. In Manhattan in 2020, almost nobody votes Republican, right? Imagine, in this case, we're talking about a conspiracy theory that was put out in Republican areas, but it could be put out in Democratic areas. It could be put out anywhere. We learn a lot from our neighbors. And if the people around you all think the same way, it's really easy for misinformation and for threats to democracy to gain traction there and not to go away. If you had to highlight one factor that contributes to the social landscape that you think is just really important to emphasize in terms of forming somebody's culture and politics, what factor would you highlight? I think the one most important is just thinking about other people. So one thing we know really, really strongly, we have evidence for this when it comes to political parties even, is when you're around people different than you, you tend, if you can, to get away. Now, not everybody can, of course, so a lot of people are sort of stuck in place. But if you can't get away, you also often are likely to change. You adopt their attitudes. If you're, for example, a Democrat and you're surrounded by Republicans, eventually your probability of becoming a Republican kind of goes up, and we can see this. A lot to unpack there, Emily, or possibly navigate, since we're talking about maps, and especially maps with too much deep red and blue on them and not enough purple. Exactly. And these red and blue areas are continuing to get redder and bluer over time. Which caught the eye of our second Ryan, Ryan Strickler, early on. He's originally from South Carolina, now teaching at Colorado State. We started this podcast a year ago with the question, how did we become so polarized? But Ryan Strickler was over a decade ahead of us. Sure. I've been interested in politics and political science for a while. I started my PhD in 2012. And I've, you know, kind of quickly as I was thinking about, you know, what I want to study, what I want to focus on, polarization jumped out at me. Uh, And it's really interesting because at the time, 2012, I was... I was thinking, oh, this is really interesting. Like, why are we so polarized? Why are we splitting apart geographically and otherwise? And it it seemed like an interesting question. And today it seems like the question, right? Like it seems like it's only, polarization is only ramped up, you know, precipitously in the last 
eight years, 10 years. So my research is, it's a, you know, a little broader than just geography specifically. And I kind of, you know, have some work in, um, you know, partisan psychology, group psychology. I'm working on a project regarding political compromise now and partisanship. So I've kind of looked at and thought about and taught and studied polarization from different tacks. So Ryan, the red, blue, sometimes purplish maps we see on election coverage, they may be helpful thinking about general elections, but maybe not so helpful when you think about party primaries. So with that in mind, should we be thinking more about these pretty clear factions within the parties than we have in recent time? I think so. I think that's a very good point. And um, maybe that's work for future research is kind of mapping geographies of factions within party. I mean, I, like, I think... I can't think of it, um, much work that has done that, really. You know, kind of it's gone beyond kind of just the red versus blue, right? And um, given the fact that, you know, we have seen, you know, this urban rural divide grow, and given the fact that between that and, say, in the House with gerrymandering and redistricting and, and the fact that there are fewer swing states, the fact that many general elections are, are not very competitive now in many, in many areas in the United States— yeah, I think we should be paying more attention to these coalitions. So I guess this is an overarching question, but to flow from that, what, in your view, are some of the primary causes of political polarization today in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean so that's a really, really good question. Like, I think it's, um, like, again, like, I mean, I think migration does play a role, like moving, you know, moving to a place that is, that is more like-minded. Like, we, as humans, like, we don't like cognitive dissonance. You know, evolutionary psychology tells us that, right? But I would say, um, I would say the, the the kind of migration, moving, moving decisions are a secondary factor. So to use kind of the some of the political science terminology, like a geographic change politically can occur because of migration. It can also occur because of conversion, right? You know, people changing in a geography, changing how they vote from Democrat to Republican or vice versa, right? You know, people can, you know, that are interactive become active voters and participants, vice versa. People that were active, maybe they become inactive. And I would say it's more conversion and mobilization, you know, driving these kind of, you know, these stark geographic voting patterns that we see. Could you think of some examples to illustrate how these different factors work? So, I mean, I'll, I'll draw on something that we, we talk about in um, in our book, actually. Um, so, um, talking about polarization in, in an historical lens, we, we look at um, two counties in particular. One is uh, Pike County, Kentucky, you know, that was a, a, in 1828 was a strong Andrew Jackson stronghold. And in, today in, in 2016, 2020 is a strong Donald Trump stronghold. The second county is... Um, Hampshire County, Massachusetts, a strong John Quincy Adams County back in 1828, and also in 2016, 20, you know, strong Hillary Clinton County in 2020, a strong Joe Biden County. It's home to um, UMass Amherst. It's um, you know kind of a highly educated area. Um, you know, large percentage of people with college degrees. It's a more urban area versus um, you know Pike County, which is um, a very rural area. To the extent that there's you know, so much of our partisan divide today is is driven by urban and rural divides, driven by divisions in education, right? You see kind of an increasing diploma gap between the Democratic Party and Republican Party, uh, you know, kind of race and attitudes on race being an you know, increasing partisan divide in our country, you know, kind of perspectives on things like Black Lives Matter or, or other you know, one thinks of the question of systemic racism or um, the need or not need to address it. You know, Pike County being a predominantly white county, predominantly non-college educated county, you know, is in a county that increasingly over the past, you know, few decades, certainly past few years, has gone towards the Republican Party versus uh, Hampshire County, Massachusetts, a highly educated, large percentage of people of college degrees, more urban county, more diverse county, increasingly going towards the Democratic Party, increasingly darker and darker blue. So do you think that it's location that attracts people who are already in certain parties to move or stay there? Or do you think that living in certain locations is actually what drives people towards a certain party to begin with? I think it's a little bit of both. You know, honestly, I think, I mean, if I had to put like my thumb on one side or the other, I think it's certain types of people are attracted to certain types of localities. And then just going off of that, we had a 
guest earlier named Abigail Marsh. She's a neuropsychologist from Georgetown who specializes in social interaction in general. And so she kept mentioning the importance of the contact hypothesis and just having contact with people who are different than you. It gives you more empathy and more understanding to have conversations. Do you think that we're losing that? Yeah, I think we are losing that. I think that is a concern. I mean, it's there's so many ways in our lives in which we silo ourselves, right? You know, and, and a lot of times people think of like siloing, like information siloing, lack of social contact, as, as you mentioned, as as with regards to the media, right? We, you know, our media diets or our social media diets are like-minded enclaves. I think it's underappreciated though, kind of the way we silo ourselves in our physical spaces. If you walk around you know, your neighborhood or you go to the store and you, you don't see anybody that has a Trump sticker on their car, you know, and that's like alien to you. Or, or conversely, if you don't see anybody that has a Biden sticker or, you know, a sticker about climate change on their car, perhaps, or something like that, it extends the, the sense that, you know, your political opponent is not a political opponent, but an alien. Do you think that that has a serious threat then to undermining our elections and therefore our democracy because of that inability to empathize? Yes, I mean, I, I think that's one of the biggest, the biggest challenges. It's the, the biggest things we need to get back, like as, as a society, right? Is is that sense of empathy? I mean, I'm, I'm I'll look forward to listening to the podcast because I'm really interested in this topic as well, right? Empathy is different than like compromise, right? Or it's different than you don't have to be even be like open minded to something, but just to understand why somebody would think in a different way. You know, we have checks and balances, and in order to get anything done, there has to be consensus. And um, without empathy, it's, you know, bargaining, consensus, compromise goes out the window. Um, it's more gridlock, and, and potentially then people maybe are more likely to say, hey, this, you know, these liberal democratic institutions like rule of law and, and elections and things, like, what are they doing for us, right? We just, we, we can't do anything. We're, we're mired in gridlock and, and they're more willing to throw that kind of stuff out the window, which is scary. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, geography plays into it too. Geography is one of the factors and the ways we silo ourselves certainly plays into it. So we started this episode thinking about maps and the colors on those maps. But what's really important is the social psychology behind those deep red and deep blue areas. And the negative partisanship that results when many Americans literally do not know anybody from the other ideological camp. We learned the dangers of that way back in our early season one interview with Abigail Marsh of Georgetown. There's an interesting phenomenon known as the outgroup homogeneity phenomenon by which we tend to view members of outgroups as kind of abstractions. This is a topic I bring up in my classes sometimes, the fundamental tension between diversity and empathy, and I mean any kind of diversity. And I think that's what happens across the ideological divide. You know, for somebody who hates Donald Trump, it is impossible for them to imagine the mind that would lead to loving Donald Trump. And so when that happens, you sort of give up on coming up with an empathic portrait of the inner life of this other person, and you just resort to stereotypes. Still, we couldn't help thinking, what could we do about these polarizing trends? Should indie-minded citizens hold summer outings for red and blue Americans to bond over tug-of-war games and popsicles? I don't know, Emily, it seems like a good idea, but tug-of-war gets tribal really fast. And you have to make sure those popsicles are all grape. You're forgetting rocket pops. But hypothetically, due to climate change or just the cost of living, would a large movement of, say, like 10% of Americans create some purple space on our maps? And maybe also some civility and compromise in our politics. Let's hear from Ryan Enos on that. Again, he's the Ryan originally from California, now at Harvard University by way of that Chicago subway. Okay, well, look, can I dodge that question a little bit um, just because I don't want to have the power to move people? But I'll tell you something that I think would help with movement. And this is something that I think is often overlooked is 
as income and lifestyle choice and a lot of things increasingly correlate with party, in many ways, you could think of it as kind of natural that Democrats are living in cities and Republicans are living in rural areas, um, especially as wealth is concentrated among increasingly among Democrats and cities are hard to live in. And frankly, this is sort of the fault of liberals in places like I live, like in Cambridge, Massachusetts and other high income cities where there's just not enough dense housing. And if you imagine that those cities were made more affordable, first of all, it, it would help like all heck with climate change because it would cut down on the greenhouse emissions and all kinds of other things. If more people could live there, maybe more Republicans would choose to live there. Maybe more people would come back out from the suburbs and go there. And I think allowing those populations to move in many ways would be something that would help a lot with a lot of the problems we're talking about. You just give people more opportunity to mix and that mixing would help with polarization. I spent 10 to 15 years living in various Asian cities that just keep growing bigger and bigger. <laughs> and one of the big factors there is the amount they invest in public transportation. You know, you can get to the center of Tokyo from, you know, a couple hundred kilometers away and on the bullet train very quickly. And we don't have that here. So do you think it's just a housing problem or could it also be like a, an infrastructure problem? Because there's a big infrastructure discussion right now. Yeah, sure. I mean, these things are all wrapped up. And unfortunately, one of the um, one of the only things when we talk about infrastructure in this country, a big portion of what we mean is actually road construction, because for some reason, Democrats and Republicans, one of the only things they can agree on. But what this means is that we don't have money for infrastructure for things like trains. I mean, the high speed rail in California, we were talking about California a little while ago, was canceled, right? I mean, you know, they tried to build it from Los Angeles to San Francisco. It makes a ton of sense. It was going to pick people up in the cities in between and bring them to those big cities. And California couldn't make it happen, right? So think about, you know, how are you going to build high-speed rail in these other places across state lines on the East Coast if one of the most liberal states in the country can't do it? And so it's vexing and it's caught up in a lot of different things about American culture and about American infrastructure and about American history that makes it hard to beat. A real city mouse versus country mouse divide in our politics. Tell me a bit more about that urban-rural divide. That rural-urban divide has led to more divisive politics. We are headed for this geographic chasm here. Joe Biden took the urban centers, Jacksonville, Tampa, Orlando, and Miami. President Trump held tight to the more rural parts of the state. The divide between red and blue may be deeper than ever, but in our county, the drive between the two is only 20 minutes. The average person not necessarily following politics all the time, but tunes in on election night over and over, sees this story of cities flowing blue, rural districts voting red, the suburbs being the swing voters. Is that too simplified a view of things? Or in fact, is that pretty much how it is? Well, I wouldn't call it too simplified because it's in many ways, it's largely accurate and it's become more accurate over time. But the thing I would say is that that misses a lot of variation. And one thing, because, you know, cities can be big. And we, if you look at, for example, if you opened up Los Angeles, you would see that you go to one part of the city and there's a lot of Republicans. And you go to other parts of cities and there's a lot of Democrats. Now, Los Angeles is a big place. But even if you look within smaller cities, you know, they don't have to be the big metropolises. You see the same thing. And one thing we've noticed in our research, and this is something that surprised us, honestly, because we watch these same news reports as everybody else, is what we can see is that even within cities, you'll see that Democrats and Republicans separate from each other. They live in distinct places. And what surprised us even more is if you go down to even smaller levels in those cities, if you go down to neighborhoods within the same city, you'll see that Democrats and Republicans tend to separate from each other a little bit, even within the same neighborhood. They don't live in the same places. And it's something that we think really demands understanding what's going on. Because as we started this conversation with, when people live separate from each other, but close by, it really increases these feelings of animosity. And it seems like we have that going on between partisans, even in neighborhoods. That was Ryan Enos, a political and social geographer at Harvard University. With help from Ryan Strickler of Colorado State, we pretty quickly learned that the reason we look at reds and blues on maps is to understand the psychology of our polarized nation. In 2019, Ryan Strickler co-authored a book, Demography, Politics, and Partisan Polarization in the U.S. from 1828 to 2016. 
In 2017, Ryan Enos published The Space Between Us from Cambridge Press, and he recently co-authored an article in the journal Nature, highlighted by the New York Times, called The Measurement of Partisan Sorting. Which has some very distinctly red and blue colored maps right down to the neighborhood level. So forget the bicycle lanes and median strips, Emily. Independent Americans need to build empathy zones nationwide. Good luck slipping that into the infrastructure bill. We'll keep you posted on that effort, as well as the social geography trends over time. But next time on The Purple Principle, we'll focus on gridlock in our nation's capital and the long-standing and long-winded Senate tool against majority party dominance, the filibuster. The filibuster means that most legislation in the U.S. Senate requires not 51 out of 100, but in fact 60 votes to pass. We'll hear from former Senate Chief of Staffer Adam Gentleson on why he thinks the filibuster must be done away with in our partisan time, like right away. This was a very centrist, moderate policy. Many would argue something that didn't even go far enough to address uh, the massacre of 20 first graders with an assault rifle in their classroom. And it failed in the Senate on a filibuster but not the kind of filibuster that people think of when they think of the filibuster. There was no Jimmy Stewart moment. There was no great speech on the Senate floor. The bill's opponents simply were able to use the modern version of the filibuster to silently raise the threshold for passing this bill. But we'll also hear from author and veteran Senate staffer Richard Ehrenberg on why removing the filibuster can be a lot like losing the keys to the bulldozer. It's a very short-sighted position to take to eliminate the filibuster to get the things done that you want done on your agenda. Because if there's one thing we know about the United States Senate is it won't be in the control of one party or the other for all that long. And that the day of reckoning will come. Join us then for our refreshingly short filibuster episode and read more about the tricky politics of this issue in our latest edition of The Purple Principle in print. You can find that on our website, purpleprinciple.com. Please also like and share us on social media and review us on Apple Music. This has been Robert Pease and Emily Crisetti for The Purple Principle team, Allison Byrne, producer, Kevin A. Klein, audio engineer, Emily Holloway, research and outreach, Dom Scarlett Research Associate. Original music composed and created by our third Ryan today, although he's Ryan number one with guitar or keyboard, Ryan Adair Rooney. 